So we are going to do the factor representations for our village case study um, and also and also talk about uh, heuristics, at least start talking about heuristics for belief space planning. And when we talk about heuristics for belief space planning, you will see some interesting connections between um, that discussion and the discussion on heuristics for stochastic planning. Okay, because in essence, um, both are about uncertainty. In the case of um, in, in, in the case of belief space planning, you have state uncertainty. In the other case, you have uh, action outcome uncertainty. Okay, and however, we actually will focus on a slightly different uh, set of techniques uh, for uh, heuristics in the belief space planning. Um, the ones discussed here are also applicable for stochastic planning. It's just that nobody used them as much. And similarly, the ones discussed in stochastic planning are applicable here too, and it's just that nobody used them here. So, so that's the thing that we have to keep in mind. Uh, and, um, okay. So, are there any questions on anything that we discussed last time? Yes. Uh, so, you had mentioned something about IDF. Oh, that's, that's, yeah, actually, in fact, it just means inverse document frequency. It is a IR information retrieval term. All that means is how unique is a feature. Okay. What was the question? He asked what, what when I mentioned IDF, I actually forgot why I mentioned IDF last class. Yeah, in, in the context of observations and how they partition the... Exactly. Space. So the thing is, if every state is giving... If a particular observation literal uh, is such that every state gives it, um, then it is basically useless. And all of them give O, then the fact that you have O as an observation doesn't tell you which state you are in. Okay? Um, so then basically it has zero IDF, essentially. Um, whereas, um, yeah, if, if and the, the very best case would be if you have an observation O1 for S1 and ON for SN and you know they only work for those states in which case you have complete partition. Okay. And so it's a question of and in that basically in that case essentially you have full observability essentially. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, you know, so basically we are talking about a representation representation for sets of states. Interestingly, actually, the, for stochastic planning, we didn't have to talk much about representation for states because, you know, normal stochastic planning, you have full observability still. That means at any point, you know the unique state you are in. And so the representation for state would still be just a set of literals. That's all, okay? Uh, here, on the other hand, your state really is a set of states. Okay, so the interesting thing is, of course, that even if the, you know, if basically given that a state is just an interpretation over the state variables, so it's like a complete formula over state variables. Every state variable appears with true or false in that uh, thing, right? However, when you have a set of, um, if you, when you have a set of uh, states, then you essentially have a disjunction over these interpretations. Okay, so in general, what would that, what that would mean is that a set of state, any any arbitrary propositional logic formula made up of the state variables will be a belief state, right? Okay, and basically the models of that formula are the states you are talking about. Okay, so it, you know up until now we acted as if really I mean, we could actually say that a state is a complete interpretation. So, not all propositional formulas uh, are, you know, the states are only just the full conjunction over uh, state variables. Now, it's just any propositional formula. Okay. The tricky thing about that essentially is, so that's a good thing in some sense because now you just, you know, basically state representation is a propositional formula. That's all. Okay. The, the, the tricky part, of course, is if you want to do things like uh, duplicate checking, right? If you want to do things like duplicate checking, previously you just had to, to check two complete states is very easy. Whereas 
to check if two, um, two, uh, two propositional formulas essentially are identical is a much harder problem. Okay, and so in fact that's where you want some canonical representations that might help you first of all, you know, for, you know, you want some way of representing these propositional formulas and you know, the two obvious ones that you already heard of um, are, uh, are uh, CNF and DNF which we can talk a little bit about um, but ultimately we'll also talk about BDDs because uh, the advantage for BDDs is that especially OBDDs is that they have this uniqueness property that means uh, if you decide the ordering of the variables and then you know you, when you convert a propositional formula into an OBDD um, and then it, another equivalent propositional formula is also converted into the OBDD then after reductions they would be identical so that's a very advantage, a big advantage, okay? And so that's why, in fact, suddenly BDDs become a big deal in belief space planning because you're using them to represent states, state sets, essentially, okay? Um, okay, so that's that's what this is saying. Um, belief states, belief space planners have to search in the space of full propositional formulas and, and then checking repeated states becomes harder, okay? Um, and then what's interesting also is that we had a so we had a clean way of talking about progression and regression over factored states for deterministic planning. Okay, progression obviously not a surprising thing, not surprising at all because you had a single state and then you apply an action, you get a new single state which will also be a complete interpretation. We also had a way of def defining regression. Um, um, now, those become slightly trickier, uh, basically given an arbitrary propositional formula phi, you would need to regress it over some action to figure out the weakest preconditions phi inverse to do regression. Okay, and similarly, um, going forward to an arbitrary propositional formula phi, uh, you want to uh, progress it to get, you know, phi dash. Okay, now we will actually, in fact, so there are two ways of doing this. One is we can actually look at either CNF or DNF representation. Uh, the DNF representation looks very much like conjunctive representation, right? Because it's, it's a disjunction of conjuncts. Whereas the CNF representation is conjunction of disjuncts. Okay, so we'll see that CNF is sort of very useful in talking about regression, CNF formulation. DNF formulation is useful for talking about progression. But then both can actually, you, you can also say to heck with it, I don't need to have a separate account of progression and regression over formulas. I will just think of progression and regression over states in terms of images and pre-images. Okay, because in terms of, if you, if you have an atomic model, Right. If you have an atomic model, um, you know, if you have an action uh, and then you have a state as S dash is its image after S. Okay, because the action itself is represented in terms of which state, you know, if you do this action in this state, what will you get? Right. Um, you can also then um, talk about pre-images, which is if if you have, you know, if after action, after action A, you have in state S, what are all the states that you could have been in from which if you did A, you would be in S? That would be the pre-image. Okay. Now, if you are thinking in the terms, so if you are doing it in atomic level and then essentially just sort of combining all the atomic level results. Okay. That's another way of doing progression and regression. That's what, more or less what BDDs wind up doing. So they don't, so, you know, in a minute we'll talk about uh, what does progression look like in the DNF representation, what does regression look like in CNF representation. But then um, if you're using BDD representation, normally what you do is you convert all of these into operations over BDDs. Images and pre-images are just operations over BDDs. Okay. And so I won't talk much about, you know, I mean, it just becomes a mechanical BDD operation. And uh, so that's, that's another way you can think about 
um, how to handle the progression regression there. Um, okay, so you already know in terms of representing logical formulas in canonical fashion, you already know CNF and DNF, right? Um, there is another one which is, as I said, reduced ordered binary relation diagram. Uh, and those we'll talk a little bit about. I'm hoping that you all read about them already. Um, and uh, so, if you have uh, some formula like this, this is a CNF representation of P implies Q and P implies S. This is a CNF representation. It's a conjunction of clauses. Each clause is a disjunction. Okay. And this is the DNF representation. It's a disjunction of clauses where each clause is a conjunction of literals. Okay, and you can also write, and these two I hope you know. Uh, and in fact, if you're taking, if you're taking an intro to AI, you always talked about how to convert a formula into the CNF fashion, because normally that's how you do theorem proving. Okay, you do the CNF classes and you do resolutions over the CNF classes until you get the empty class, right? Uh, DNF is also useful in under other circumstances. In particular, for us, we'll see that DNF looks really like states almost. Okay, so. If you, for example, uh, did, decided not to simplify the form, you know, suppose, remember that a belief state is nothing but a set of states. It's nothing but a set of complete states. That set of complete states means conjunction, I'm sorry, um, disjunction of complete conjunctions. So in fact, it's a very obvious way, you know, you, you could actually then, you, each, each state is a full conjunction and then you have all of them you know, stacked underneath each other and then when you're talking about doing a progression with this action you do the progression of this formula, progression on this formula, progression on this formula, each of them will give you a new state assuming for now you know deterministic actions and so you then have a new belief state. All, all I do when I actually uh, if I have done simplification then I might actually have a DNF representation where it won't be a complete conjunction but a partial conjunction. Okay, anyway, uh, so then uh, in terms of BDDs, um, the idea essentially is um, if you have a truth table, so basically BDD is a function over, it's a Boolean function, it's a representation for a Boolean function. Um, and then so here are x1, x2, x3, and this is the function I want to define. And I can, you know, you can clearly see that you can write it this way, you know, with some variable ordering, you know, if it's x1, start with x1, if it is true, you go this side. And then if x2 is true, you go this side and you get a 1. And so for each branch, you get 1 and 0. All that basically means is you wrote this truth table in a tree form. Okay, starting from there, what you basically want to do is you want to uh, combine all the 1s into one single node and all the zeros into one single node. Okay, so go from a tree to a directed graph. A BDD is a directed graph. Okay, um, so then th this would be, for example, the BDD for this. And so one of the advantages is if there are uh, subtrees being repeated in two directions, you can just put a pointer to the entire subtree. Essentially, that's how it becomes smaller. Okay. Uh, now the interesting thing about BDDs, which we won't talk about much afterwards. Actually, I mean the BDDs were used much more originally, you know, invented in the uh, computer aided design where they essentially it turns out that they do some of the same reasoning that we have to do which is you know you want to be able to say that whatever are the initial conditions on a boolean circuit certain bad things will never happen okay and so you are essentially taking a set of initial states and you're considering all possible events that can happen in this boolean circuit and you're showing that the, the belief state that you have will never contain a, you know, like a floating point exception or something. Okay, and um, so the circuit, so that's how you use, the, you know, use that to kind of prove the correctness of the circuit, prove that the you know, circuit would not get into, um, you know, wrong states ever, right? And to do that, they had to do this over all possible initial state configurations because you don't quite know what the initial state configuration will be for the Boolean circuit. So they needed, you know, uh, a, a, a compact representation. So VDDs were invented. Landy Bryant actually is a C8 you know, um, computer aided design guy. 
So those are the people who we came up with this idea. And one of the interesting things is that BDDs are essentially, I mean, eventually the worst case complexity of logical inference is not going to change just because you are using BDD representation as against CNF, as against DNF. Right, because uh, those complexities remain the same. What, what, what does happen is essentially that um, so you push these things, the complexity it never goes away, you push it into different pockets and then you might sometimes amortize it. So in this case, in the BDD case, one of the big issues is the order of the variables. For the same exact formula, this is the formula like say, A1 if and only if B1, A, and A2 if only if B2, and A3 if and only if B3. This is the logical formula I want to write, let's say. Okay, and here are two BDDs that correspond to that logical formula. One is huge big, one is much smaller. Okay, they both correspond to the same exact logical formula. Okay, in the sense that if I give you a truth false, uh, true false evaluation of A, B, A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, B3, this, whenever this gives true, this gives true, whenever this gives false, this gives false, and vice versa. That's why they're equivalent. However, the difference between these is, notice that this guy, I don't know if you can see this, it's starting with A1, it asks questions about A1 first, then on B1, then on A2, then on B2, then on A3, then on B3, in this case. Here, he's asking questions on A1 first, then A2, then A3, then B1, then B2, then B3. So the order of questions have changed, and that makes a huge difference. This is sort of like decision trees. You know, it's like, which questions do you ask first? Okay, in, in some sense what you're seeing here is, as soon as you know A1, you can actually decide on B1. That's what this guy is doing. As soon as it knows A1, it decides on B1 right away because there is a good relation there. Okay, now oftentimes this is post facto analysis. You know, you can see this uh, particular formula and say, yeah, this would be better than this. The interesting question of course is, is there a way of coming up with an ordering of variables such that the BDD will be the smallest? What do you think? Obviously, if there is some polynomial way of doing that, then again, there is some, you know, uh, some uh, background and backdoor we found into the complexity. So once again, finding the optimal ordering of variables is computationally hard. However, there are enough heuristics that people use and basically, for the rest of our discussion, there are BDD packages which will basically just do some heuristic de you know, dis decision on the variable ordering and they'll stick to it. That's it. Okay. And as long as you stick to one variable ordering, then that's an ordered binary decision diagram. And so if you stick to the same set of questions and you give two logical formulas that happen to be equivalent, but there's, you know, syntactically you can't say them being equivalent, Okay, um, then um, you really cannot, then basically you will get the same structure, given the same ordering. Now, if in fact, if you use this ordering for this particular formula, you have got a big thing, that's all, you cannot help it. Okay. Um, now, why is this connected um, for us? Why is this interesting for us? Because, in essence, the interesting thing about BDD is, is not just that you can represent formulas in BDD trees, but that you can do many operations on the BDD trees, I mean, in the BDD graphs, okay, directly. And most operations, most reasonable operations on the binary decision diagrams are polynomial time. Okay, and so you never, you know, once you convert these formulas, logical formulas into BDDs, then you do all operations in terms of, you know, these BDD operations directly. And so these are all the constructor operations, and so, you can convert everything about your task into a BDD operation. And if you can, then BDD would be a great representation for you. Okay. And so in terms of belief space planning, essentially what you needed to understand was the representation of states can be done as BDD, but the projection itself should be done as a BDD. And we actually, I mean, if you, if you read the uh, section, you would have realized that projection, I mean, an action essentially uh, uh, becomes a big BDD. Okay, and then given an initial state specification, then the action BDD can basically tell you what the new state specification will be. Okay, uh, okay, so 
Now, to get that into our head, you know, to see essentially that in fact everything can be written as just a big logical formula. Um, you can say, suppose you have some uh, some event system like this, where essentially I'm using atomic, um, you know, representation here. Okay, um, so I have the my initial I state S is represented with some formula over propositions, and so the state one is locked and the not bad position and not loaded. This is this, this is this, and so uh, a set of states is just a disjunction of those. So that would be a formula. Now, if I give you two BDDs, I can compute a BDD that corresponds to the disjunction of it. I can compute a BDD that corresponds to the conjunction of it. And then, any time you come do these operations, then there are some um, canonical reduction operations on top of BDDs that will clean up the structure such that there are no redundant branches. We'll see some examples right now in a minute. Okay. Um, what's much more interesting is this stuff. You're not surprised. What's more interesting is you can write the entire transition function itself as a BDD. A transition function is just all possible actions you can do from this state. Okay, so it's not, we're no longer talking about single actions. You can write the entire transition function itself as a BDD. And how do you do that? So um, basically you do this dash representation, you know, so uh, variables of the current states are x, y, z and variables of the new states are x dash, y dash, z dash. And then, uh, you know, Suppose I have a suppose I have a my transition says that if I was if I am in one I can get to two. Okay, one is this, and then I guess two is not written here, but you know, two is this. Okay, um, so if I'm in one, this I can get to two. That just becomes this about the pre-state variables, and this is going to be true of the post-state variables. So you just have a copy of, you know, both the pre-state and the post-state. Both of them are represented in the same state variables. Okay. Uh, so then you have, you know, this. If you're here, you get this. And if you're here, you'll get this. And um, now the total transition function is this whole thing. And it. Right? No, I'm sorry. Wait. Um, yeah, so if you are 1, you will get here, if you are in 2, you will get here, um, and the transition is, so for each, let's see, transition relation is represented as the disjunction of these transitions, the disjunction of these transitions, which will be another big formula, okay? So, one of the things, of course, is that, so you have a huge BDD sitting there, representing the entire transitions that are possible from the, if, if you just happen to tell me what the current state is. Now if I tell you what the current set of states are, then it will tell me the new set of states. Okay. After execution of a single action, it's not a big BDD for all of your actions, it's just per action. No. It actually can do, no, this, this is for all actions together. So if you do this particular action, you will get this state. So in some sense, one of the interesting things is that BDDs, because they are so drunk with the power of being able to represent, you know, sets of states, right? One of the interesting things you can do is you can do um, breadth first search with BDDs in deterministic planning. Okay, so each level is a BDD. Now, okay, and each level is essentially a possible set of states that you can reach starting from the first state, and then you have a whole bunch of states you can reach for the first level, whole bunch of states you can come get to the second level, and so here the at each level you only have one you know description. It's just a huge big description, and in fact there was a planner called BDD plan, which did this for deterministic planning. So, I mean, we are talking about BDDs in the context of belief states, but essentially they can be used whenever you need to represent, you know, any, any propositional formula. And an entire fringe of a breadth-first search tree can be represented as a BDD. Okay? And so anyway, so it's, not, I mean, and then, so when you have when you have a you know a propositional formula like this, which is a which which is a 
the transition function and you have your current state, then you can compute the forward and backward image as again essentially the projection operations over this, um, uh, this formula. So for example, the forward image of S is any S dash such that, you know, that S belongs to the, so for any state that is in S, S S dash is in the transition function which is basically what you would have said. I mean, in a transition function is saying, if you are in state S, here are all the actions that are applicable and they, this is where they'll take you. So if you are computing the forward image, then it gives you the set of states you can get to starting from here. Yes? Just if the PDD defines like this global transition function that's each action onto the possible successors, wouldn't the transition function be a triple? It uh, should. It should actually talk about which action you are picking. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's how it's going. Okay. Um, and then similarly, you can compute the backward image. And what's interesting is these operations, backward and forward operations, they are, I, I mean, I forget the BDD terminology, but this is essentially like, it's, you know, again, this is a propositional logical formula. So this is sort of syntactic sugar. Okay. This is not really true existential. Okay, so it's what you're saying is there exists an x such that x is a state, and there is a, a transition. There is an element t x x dash, in which case you want to basically get that x. Okay, um, let us see. Wait. No, you want to get x dash in this case out. So there exists an x such that it's a state, and from x you get to x dash. That's what this was saying. And the similarly, the other one is also saying an existential operation. And all these existential operations correspond to some, I think, BDD projections. Okay, you must have read this in, in the section that I asked you. Okay. okay, so a set of states is a logical formula, a transition function is also a logical formula, a projection is a logical operation right now. And in fact, each logical operation corresponds to a BDD operation. And so a BDD planner just does a bunch of BDD operations one after. So that's one way of dealing with it. So here is an example. In this case, um, the, set, the, the set three would just be corresponding to this particular BDD. Uh, set of all states, state three would correspond to this BDD. The set of all these three states, one, three, or five, corresponds to the smaller BDD because it's a smaller logical operator, you know, formula. The smaller the formula, sometimes the more st in states you represent, right? Um, so that's, and then the transition function here, you know, is also, so in this particular case, 4 goes to 4, you can go from 4 to 4 or 4 to 3, okay, and that's represented as that, where again the second state is in the dash format and the first state is in the non-dash format, okay. So what you're supposed to be doing is some, uh, you know, this existential operation, notice that it is over a BD for S and a BD for T. So this, this operation is done over those two. So these are the quantification operations, okay? And so that, you know, is, that can be defined and then, you know, you essentially would be doing symbolic progression and symbolic regression in terms of BDD study. Okay. Uh, actually, I mean, there's a lot more that can be done, in understood in terms of actual BDD operations. I'm not going to do it here. Um, uh, I'll give you a little example. Um, so, for example, restriction execution example. So, if I have, let's say, a BDD like this, and um, um, I want, so that's my function, and I want to restrict this such that B is equal to 1. Okay, so all that would mean is that B basically can never be false, so this part of the tree is cut off. This part is cut off. And so now it actually becomes A, B, C, and since then this is just a, I'm sorry, um, so when A is false, you may as well directly connect it to C because B doesn't have any effect. So that's what I did here. Okay, now having done this, now a reduction operation will say A is really not playing any effect, you know, any, any part because whether A is true or A is false, you'll get to C anyway. So you can remove A and then you'll get this. So these are the reduction operations that you do. Um, most BDD operations will look like you know changing the pointers and doing a bunch of reductions. 
Okay. So the the interesting things about this is the pro of course is equality test of two BDDs is constant time as long as the ordering is the same. The basic propositional operations are poly polynomial in the size of the BDDs themselves. Okay. Um, but quantification is exponential in the variables being quantified. So in some sense, the projection operation could be costly because it's a quantified operation. Okay. So there has been work which actually just directly used BDDs in the belief space planning. In particular, there's been you know planners directly use BDD presentations and underlying BDD operations for progression and regression. Okay. Uh, so that's one reason why you want to understand that here. Okay, so we talked about representations. Uh, as far as uh, progression and regression are concerned, essentially, I would have just done these for BDDs. Okay, I will actually talk to you a little about what you could do if you are sticking to either CNF or DNF representation, because that is something that you know we have talked about before. So we can see how the planning operations change a little. Okay, um, and also in terms of the way you do the search, essentially the underlying representation is one aspect and which direction you take in the search is a different aspect. That's an orthogonalization. So, you know, we don't need to think directly in terms of what it is. Okay. Um, so, here is a little example. Uh, in this case, there is no sensing action. The first example, no sensing actions. Okay. So, it's just basically, and they're all deterministic. As I said, although you could have both deterministic and non-deterministic actions, we will stick to deterministic actions right now. And the uncertainty is only in the state. So in the initial state, I will say M is true and exactly uh, 1 of P, Q and R are true, let's say. Suppose that's what you want to say. Then essentially, the initial state formula would look like that. OK? Um, yeah, so M is true and either P is true and Q and R are false or Q is true and R and P are false and R is true and P and Q are false. Only one of them has to be true. Only, only one of them must be true, not has to be true. One of them must be true. So if this is your initial state formula, if you, you know, you can of course write this into BDD. We would not talk about that, that anything can be done in BDD. Uh, if you wrote it in a DNF formulation, it would be essentially, you know, that that M essentially will just be distributed over all of these and so M and this or M and this or M and this. So the DNF representation almost looks like essentially a disjunction of states. Modulo any common elements which don't have to be appearing at all. Okay. Uh, now if you are talking about the CNF representation for this, then it looks like this. Okay, so it will be P R Q R R and not P R not Q and not P R not R. Now basically these are your mutex representation. Anytime you say P and Q are not possible together, that would be not P R not Q. Okay, so you would just say you say the disjunction has to be true and there are three mutexes. And then of course, okay, that will get you conjunction over disjunction. That's the CNF formula for this. Okay, so DNF is, you know, you can almost see how progression can use this representation because it almost, you can act as if each of these are states and do the progression. And you can also, it's, I'll show you that regression would actually be easy to generalize to work with CNF. Okay, that's the pond paper that I asked you to read, the sections, they basically talk about the CNF representation there. Okay, CNF is actually quite good for regression. Um, so progression, I mean, so you can think of these as constituents and the constituents take the place of states. Okay. Okay, so here is a progression example. So you start from here and suppose I have this action A3 which gives, uh, which requires M and says if R is true then L is true. Okay, uh, and I have a precondition. So Basically, I couldn't even have done this action if all of these states, all of the constituents must have M. Otherwise, I can't do this action. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so it turns out that thankfully M is there in every one of them. And then, all you do is you doctor each constituent, essentially. So, whenever uh, R is true, you make L also true. So, in this case, R is not true. So, you do nothing here. In this case, um, 
R is not true, you do nothing. In this case, R is true, so you add L. That's it. Okay. And then uh, now I do A5, L implies G. Uh, it's again, when I write it like as a conditional, this is a conditional effect. So that means A5 can be applied to any of the states. And whenever L is true, it also throws in a G. Okay. And um, um, so now, interesting thing is, remember, in, in the in, in, I have a little problem here with action A1 is this, A2 is this, A3 is this, A4 is this, and A5 is this. And my goal is I want to get G. That means I need to be able, so my belief state should satisfy G. That means every state in the belief state should satisfy G. That means every constituent in the belief state should satisfy G. Okay, so in this particular case, one of my constituents already satisfied G, I still have to work on the other two. Otherwise, I can't stop because I have no sensing action right now. Right? So until I can get a G at the end of this and this also, I have to keep continuing. Okay, that would be the way progression would work in this case. Okay, um, regression um, for the same problem. Again, remember in the in for that problem, the initial state now looks like P R Q R R, not P R not Q, not P R not R, not Q not R and M, and goal state is still G. That means any state where G is true is a goal state. Okay, and uh, these are the actions. So I start with G, and when I regress, um, so I can take I can use A four which gives G. Okay, and it will say if k is true, then I'll give you a g. The one thing that you will have to deal with is since it's a partially observable world, disjunctions cannot be split into the search space. Okay, in fact, one of the interesting questions is in classical planning, let's say, if I tell you in the classical planning, if I tell you that your goal is g1 or g2. You could have solved that by essentially splitting that into the search space. Okay, so in this branch, try to make G1 true. In this branch, make G2 true. If any one of them work, you're done. Okay, whereas in in a partially observable world, it may well be the case that you will never be able to tell whether G1 is true or G2 is true, but may still be able to say that one of them is true. In which case you may be able to achieve this goal, but not the stronger ones G1 and G2 separately. Because G1 implies G, G1 or G2. G2 implies G1 or G2. When you split this into two different conjuncts and work on each of them, in essence, you are working on the stronger versions of this goal. Okay, In the deterministic case, it's equivalent. Because there is no way G1 or G2 will be true without one of them specifically being true and you knowing that that one thing is true. In the, in the, in the partially observable case, you may only know that G1 or G2 is true without knowing which, piece, which particular literal became actually true. Okay. Yes. When you're doing regression from G, why wouldn't it be not G? Um, so, when, so A4 is giving G, and I mean, if, if, so the problem is that if K is true, then it would give G. In the successor state. Yeah, if K was true, it would give G. Okay, but you may not be able to tell whether K is true or not. Okay, so the weakest precondition is either K is true, in which case because of K being true, A4 gave you G. Or G is already two by this point, in which case, because of A4, you would get G. So think of this as the search that you are doing, when it is actual, during the execution, you will not be able to see the state. Okay, so first of all, the not G aspect doesn't even make sense, because there is no real reason why A4 requires G to be false. A4 doesn't care whether G is false or not. All A4 says is, if you give me K, I'll give you G. Okay, if you know, I mean, 
that I if, if there is a way in which you can guarantee that you gave you, you gave k and you can actually sense that you given the k you know you can just write k that's what you would have done normal regression in, in normal regression in classical planning when g was replaced over a4 you would just have written k right now I'm just saying since you don't know whether or not since there could be one of these things could be partially observable Okay, and so you essentially say G would be true if either G is already true or A4 made it true. So because whether or not you're within a goal state itself is partially observable, you don't know if you are or not. Exactly. That's why you have the G there. Yeah, that's the point, right? Because this, this is, you know, there is initial state uncertainty and you have to guarantee, without knowing where you are, you have to guarantee that you are in a goal satisfying state. So it's sort of, this is a counterintuitive aspect, you know. It looks as if um, you are essentially, but, but notice that it's, it's interesting. So you have to realize that the action, use of action has weakened your constraint, okay. Originally you had to guarantee G. By agreeing to use an action A4, you now only have to guarantee G or K. G or K is weaker than G. And if you keep weakening it, at some point of time, this weakened formula might be true in the initial state. That's all you are, that's progress. While coming down, you want to keep weakening things. Okay? So here we're essentially doing, looking for a conformant plan. In both cases, yeah. Because if you have initial state uncertainty, you, you know, basically, and, and then the, the actions, there is no sensing action at all. So the only thing you can do is conformant plan. Now notice that these, both this regression search and the progression search will work without change if in fact there is no initial state uncertainty. Because not having any uncertainty in the initial state is just a special case of having uncertainty. What won't work is if you have sensing actions. If you have sensing actions then the search itself has to be changed. You need to consider the ability to sense the world. Okay. So, um, and you know, so in, in fact, the, the fact that the progression, basically, it's not surprising to realize that the progression for conformant planning will work for, as a progression for classical planning because essentially the DNF formula would only have one constituent. Because if you have no state uncertainty in the initial state, then DNF formula will only have one constituent. Okay? Whereas for the regression, since you are starting from the goal side, you don't quite know whether when you reach the initial state, whether you'll have a complete initial state or not. So the conformant regression essentially, you know, instead of just saying reduce G to K, it says I'm only able to reduce G to G or K. It will still work if whether the goal state, it will work when the initial state is complete. It will also work when the initial state is incomplete. Okay. So then I throw in A5 and A5 basically says if you give me L I can give you G and so I'll say well either L is true or K is true or G is true. Okay, it looks like you're not making any progress but you have to realize that this formula is weaker than this, this is weaker than this. And so that's progress. And then I throw in A1, A1 says G or K or L or P because A1 says if M is uh, it will require M to be true before it, so that's why I threw in M. Okay, and if uh, K, it can give you K if Q is true before. I'm sorry, which one am I? A one. Yeah, it can give you K if P is true. So I throw in P here. Okay. Now, so the enabling first precondition also has to be added to this formula, essentially. Okay. So now I throw in. Um, a2, now I throw in A2 uh, basically because A2 can give me K again and by requiring Q. Okay. Now, and then I also do an A3 because A3 gives me an L uh, by requiring R. The funny thing, it looked as if I'm going in sort of a garden path, but by the time I came here, I have this class and this class. All I need to say is both of the classes are true in the initial state. If so, I am done. Okay. 
you know, this class has already been true in the initial state. M was true in the initial state here. But this was not in the initial state. Neither is this true in the initial state. This one is. Because this is PR, QR, R, R, these other things. And since PR, QR, R is true, this whole thing is true. So you weakened it successively such that the entire disjunction th that you could stop with the initial state. Okay, so notice that notice that if in fact the initial state was certain and you knew P was true, let's say, okay, then you would have stopped right here. Do you understand? So that's how conformant planning is cast clear because you have to go farther. And sometimes you may never reach the initial state. Okay, so that's the way to understand. And in fact, this kind of gives you a feel for how does the problem become harder? You know, because you are essentially weakening the formula until it holds in the initial state. And if the initial state is incomplete, then the initial state is giving you less amount of guarantees than a complete initial state. That's the basic idea. Okay. So that's about you know progression and regression and, you know, and conformant planning. And you can do this thing, of course, uh, you can use progression and regression over BDDs. I just won't describe it here. In fact, there are BDD-based planners which will dive directly to the progression and regression. And you know, these are all of these would be BDDs. And the gold test would be in terms of BDDs. Okay. Um, okay, sensing. So we get into sensing now, and when you have sensing essentially. Uh, this is actually a slight repetition of last class, so I'll go quickly here. Um, you basically, since you have factored representation, you will assume that the sensing is going to give you the truth or falsity of some formula over these variables. Okay, the simplest case, as I mentioned, is uh, each sensing action corresponds to sensing the status of one state variable. Okay, a more complicated, so for example, the, I have a sense P action, which will just tell me whether P is true or false, that's all. A more complicated sensing might be that I will be able to, I don't have an action for sensing P, what I have is an action for sensing P, R, Q, and R. So whenever this formula is true, sense will say yes, otherwise it will say no. Okay, obviously handling these kinds of sensing actions is more complex than handling these. Okay, but it depends on what sensing actions are available in your domain. Okay, so mostly we will actually look at this in the example we are looking at today. Um, but it's interesting that not every variable has to have a sense action. If every variable has a sense action, then it's a fully observable word. Right, that means you are completely partitioned the state space um, using the observations. Okay, um, so... Uh, the other thing to know, let's see, um, the other thing to notice about the sensing actions, again something that I mentioned last time is at one time the sensing effects of an action would increase the knowledge of the agent. If it's a pure sensing action, it only changes your knowledge, it doesn't change the world. Okay, but at the plan time, you, the agent has to consider both possibilities. That when you do this sensing action at the run time, uh, it can say P is true and it can say P is false. If it says P is true, what are you going to do? If it says P is false, what are you going to do? So in the plan, it, it introduces branches. So you'll get a tree plan. You make the assumption that sensing action is always correct. Yeah, right now, yes. Right now, yes. You know, the idea of sensing action itself giving you a probabilistically correct sensing observation is what we'll deal with in palm debris. That's when you will start having probabilistic uncertainty rather than just non-deterministic uncertainty. Okay. So now one of the one of the like a mind-numbing things is the nice semantics of regression get very iffy when you have sensing actions. Because one silly thing that would happen is if you regress two belief states B and F and B and not F over a sensing action, sense F, it will become B. Because if you had just B, then and you sensed F, then it will become B and F and B are not F. So if you regress, you know these two have to be combined to become B. And that would basically 
introduce so one of the big problems in sensing actions is in the search the directionality is lost because you don't quite know what to sense okay the problem basically I'm trying to say is if I have B I can take any arbitrary Q and say B and Q B and not Q so I'm conditioning B over Q and not Q and then I can throw in like a sense Q here and then I'll get a B here. Now the question is, is Q worth sensing or not, really? Was it important or not? And that becomes a harder issue. So um, as far as I can tell, at least with my knowledge, uh, heuristics for planning with sensing are harder. I mean, I don't have a clean idea myself. I'll tell you some places you can read, but we can talk about the overall search, but how to actually pick which sensing action is worth doing is a trickier issue. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, this this part is essentially this idea about um, a partition. So, if you have a set p of state variables, and um, and if I only have a set v of them that are observable, that means each of those variables have an observation action. Okay. Then essentially. Uh, only if that variable p is in b, then it is observable. Okay. If the if b is equal to p, if it's, it's you know b is a subset of p and p is a subset of b, then it's a fully observable case. Okay. Otherwise, then the ones that you are not observing. So suppose uh, there there is one variable left in p that's not in b, then that means with the sensing actions you have, you essentially split the world states into two states, two equivalence classes. One equivalence class where that variable is true, other equivalence class where variable is false. Okay, And for every variable that cannot be sensed, you essentially increase the number of equivalence classes. Okay, um, sorry, wait. No. Uh, um, If, so if for the case where b is empty, what happens? For the case where b is empty, then none of the variables can be sensed. Which, which essentially actually means that all states of the world are in one observation partition. Okay, when b is equal to p, then every state can be sensed separately. So each state is in its own observation partition. In between, you will have you know fewer partitions than number of states and more partitions than just one. Okay, and that's sort of what is uh, uh, formalized with this notion of observation classes. Okay, um, so observability partition states into classes S1, etc., up to Sn, such that they are all indistinguishable. Okay, and uh, in the case of full observability, it's partitioned into single st singleton states. Um, Non-observability, the entire state space becomes one, and partial observability, it's between one and the number of states, is the equivalence classes. This is something that we talked about in terms of atoms. Now we are talking atomic representation of observations. Here we are talking about a specific kind of observation where, um, remember previously we said uh, we we talked about a more general view of what's the probability that a particular observation literal would be given if you are in state S. Now, in basically, you are only talking about what's the probability that you would say P is true if you are in state P, Q, R. Right? Because all your observations are essentially about the state of the variable itself. So in this case, it will say true. Otherwise, it will say false. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so basically, everything conformant planning essentially means the entire state space looks like one partition for you, and so that's why you don't quite know how to differentiate which particular partition, which particular state in that partition you are in. You know, if you have uh, some things observable, then you might be able to tell that I'm in this partition versus this versus this. 
and if the partitions are, if you have full observability, that means the partitions actually correspond to individual states. Okay. So again, this is a simple progression algorithm in the presence of pure sensing actions. Okay. I'm essentially talking about pure causative plus pure sensing. Uh, although there was a, a, a slide which I threw in here, which basically says a general action may have both causative effects and sensing effects. I'm not going to get into that. There are actually very interesting issues there as to when you have both causative and sensing effects, how do you handle the actions? Okay. Um, right now we we'll look at a pure sensing action and a pure causative action, and being both of them being combined. And the progression basically previously used to just not have this. This was progression other than without this line. So what you do, you start from the belief state, and if it's already satisfied, if, if goals are satisfied in every belief state, you stop. If not, you non-deterministically choose one of the actions, apply it to the belief state, get a new belief state, and repeat. That's what you were doing before. Now you just throw in one additional non-deterministic choice, which is pick a sensing action and apply. Okay, so either you can uh, choose a causative action that is applicable in B and apply it, or you can do a sensing action and just do that sensing. Okay, now when you commit to doing the sensing, so when you, well, in this case, if you choose action, uh, causative action A, then you basically return as the resulting state, the belief state that comes from application of A to B, the goal remains the same and whatever was your previous plan plus this last action, the prefix has increased by action A. Okay. If you chose to do the uh, sensing action on uh, let's say some particular formula F, let's assume formula F actually is a literal for now, Okay. then what you will actually get is two branches now. One branch where you call the plan uh, with B and F true. Okay, and the goal remains the same. And the another branch where B and F is false, and the goal remains the same. Actually, this should not be nil, it should be, this path is supposed to be the current plan, it should be whatever the old plan is. Plus the sensing action. I mean, this is a mistake, I should change this. The nil should be P plus the sensing action S. Okay, um, so basically now what happens is that uh, the search has started with B0, A, B1, uh, let's say small a, small a1, let's say, and B1, small a2, B2, then you do a sensing action S on uh, let's say F, and then you get B2 and F here, B2 and not F here. Okay, and now this needs to be taken to the goal, and this also needs to be taken to the goal. So by putting in a sensing action, now you have basically split your original goal into two branches now. And if you then put in another sensing action here, that will all again split it into more branches. So that's how you are sort of slowly building a um, building a, um, a tree structured plan. And what is interesting about this particular uh, formulation also is that it makes it clear that you could have problems where you could do plan with less sensing versus more sensing, including the special case of no sensing. So there may be problems where you could do no sensing plan as well as with sensing plan, and both of them are possible. And the question then as to which one you are supposed to pick depends on the cost matrix. You know, is sensing costly versus doing the action cost? Okay, at least this will define the search space such that all plans are present in the space. Okay, so here is an example, a very simple example where, uh, you know, uh, these are the actions A1 and A2 and A3 and there is one particular observation action, all it does is observe speed. Okay. Uh, and then I started by observing, uh, and in the beginning I don't know which state I am in, so basically I am in true. 
if I'm not, if I don't know which data I'm in, then basically my formula is true, right? Uh, then um, I'm in. Uh, then I do an observation action O5. Then that will basically get me into a belief state P and another belief state not P. And from belief state P, I can do A1 and then A3, and then I can get to GR and not P. And you know, so I got G true on this branch. And then on the same thing, I can do A2 and then A3. I'll get GR and P, and I got G again. So that's my plan. So it basically, both branches are ending in a goal containing formula. Now this also sort of tells you. I mean, if you are into it, you can say, well, you know, which branches are you going to? I mean, if you, you know, the, the normal way to do it is to, if you have a conditional plan, every branch needs to be taken to the goal state. But if you want to do limited contingency planning, where you don't want to consider some of the contingencies because you think they will never happen, then you can decide, let's say, I mean, you know, I have two branches, I'll only work on one branch. Because I, I mean, if I happen to know, you know, that there's a prior probability that when you do O5, the chance that actually P, P will be false is higher. That will tell you that the P is false is higher. So I will just, you know, make this plan and, and wait to extend this only if in fact the sensing action comes and tells me that P is in fact true, in which case then I still have to extend it. Okay, yes sir. So what about the situation where you know what, like, your contingency plan, but you know that some possibilities are easily escapable. So for example, suppose it was very simple to make F true in this diagram on the board. Mm -hmm. Then you could easily essentially go from B2 and not F to B2 and F and then only explore one branch because you can easily escape from that possibility. So the question is again, you're talking about whether it is easy to replan later on. That's That can be taken into account. Okay, again, all I'm saying at this point is I'm really only teaching, telling you how to make a complete conditional plan and I'm giving you speculative directions as to how you can convert it into something that's more limited contingency. But truly to take limited contingency planning, I mean, to have a, a systematic limited contingency planner, you need to have the notion of cost and the probabilities thrown in. Otherwise you don't quite know which ones are you know, worth leaving out. Okay. Um, Okay, so that's uh, regarding the conditional plan. Here is a more interesting conditional planning example, which is actually kind of, you know, worth looking at only because essentially you may not have thought about that. So it may actually be the case that sometimes you only have sensing actions to some of the variables and you are going to use causative actions. So suppose I want to kind of, in this particular case, essentially, um, so let's just look at this problem. Uh, so the patient uh, is not yet dead and may be ill. Okay? And uh, we want to make the patient not be ill. Okay? And the way you basically do is you can try to give them some medicine, then they'll become not ill. But then this medicine will kill them if they are actually not ill. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's just, you know, although medicines don't normally kill people, but like for example, when you take an MRI for no good reason, that's not a good thing for you at all. So in the malls, apparently they have started doing these whole body scams for people who are paranoid about their health. You say, hey, here's $100 and they'll put you in this whole body uh, scan and you feel good. But you shouldn't be feeling good because you're going to get cancer if you didn't have one already. Okay, when you have cancer, it'll probably find it, but you know, I'm, I'm, you know, but if you don't, it'll give you a little. Okay, and so there's always a cost for sensing. I mean, there's always a cost for those kinds of uh, tests, and in this case, the cost is stark. If you give that, you know, medicine to the guy who's not ill, he would die. If the if you don't give the medicine to the guy who is ill, he would die too, and you want to make sure he doesn't die. And so the only way you can figure out is whether or not he has the disease. If he does have the disease, you'll give the medicine. If not, you won't give the disease. You won't give the medicine. But normally, you may not be able to observe the variable, do you have disease. Instead, you observe a test variable, which is if you do a test, you know, for the guy with this disease, this particular paper will turn blue. If not, it will turn yellow. Okay? Now again, if it's a you know deterministic case, then basically all these tests will be deterministic, and so 
it will always turn blue versus always turn yellow based on and so it will give you perfect information on that variable. In the probabilistic case normally what happens is the test gives you probabilistic information on the variable of interest. Okay. So in this case uh, there is a test uh, for doing um, uh, staining, uh, stain test which essentially um, will convert the paper to blue if in fact um, uh, this guy has uh, a disease and the paper won't be blue if the guy doesn't have disease. Okay, so the disease is ill. Okay, so if he is ill, it will become blue. If it's not ill, then it will become not blue. So that's kind of nice. So previously you were either this or this state. Now you are, by doing this action, you are in this or this state. Now you can actually partition on B blue versus not blue and so you actually sense uh, the color, sense the paper color and then when you sense it during the test execution you will tell you whether it's blue or not blue and if it is, if it's not blue then you are done. Remember during the planning you don't know which one will happen so you need to take both branches down and uh, when it's not blue then that's goal already because not ill and not dead is what is what you are interested in. So, the, so remember that the goal is uh, not ill and not dead is the goal and your belief state right now contains only one state and that is a goal state. So you get to stop. In this case you still can't stop because it's not dead and ill. I'm sorry, not dead and ill and you want to make it not dead and not ill. You do medication, at this point it will become ill becomes not dead. Okay, so that's basically what is involved. It's, it's a very nice problem that tells you the issues involved in sensing. And what is interesting is um, how do you know what tests to do going forward? In general, you don't know while going forward what actions are worth doing. Now you also have this additional issue of what tests to do. Okay. Uh, I mean, but, you know, in terms of just existential proof that a solution exists in the overall search space, here is, here is one, so you can find one. Okay, so that kind of brings us to the question of heuristics. How do you start, you know, pushing these kinds of planners in the right direction, okay? Which we will start today, I have five more minutes, right? And, uh, and then continue next class, okay? Um, this I will skip, this also I will skip. And then I will talk about heuristics for belief space planning. Uh, so, let's start again with conform and planning because, as I already told you, I don't quite understand how to do heuristics for when there are sensing actions. So that's kind of open; you can do work on it. Um, but when the case of, in the case of conform and planning, okay, uh, how do you find out heuristics? So the first idea is this: you know, heuristics come from relaxations, right? So the first idea is to find a relaxation of the conformant planning which turns out to be a classical planning. Okay, so if, um, so here's the story. So if I think I'm in either S1 or S2 or S3 and I need to go to G, okay, um, then I can relax it in terms say, well, I'll just assume I'm in S1 and I'll need to go to G. And then I'll find the true cost of going from S1 to G. Do you see what I'm saying? True cost of going from S1 to G. And you can see that that cost would be an underestimate of the cost of taking S1 or S2, I mean, no, actually it's not. <laughs> so, if you pick the wrong one, then it won't be. Okay, um, wait. I think it's an underestimate, isn't it? It can either be an underestimate or an overestimate. And that's the most expensive one. It, uh, no, no, because no, actually, no, it's conjunctive, right? You have to take all of them to G. And so anybody you pick will only be an underestimate. So this is actually an admissible heuristic, it turns out. It's like the thing in this disjunction is it's not that if you are S1, I'll take you to the goal, the rest of you, you die. That's not going to work. You know, a conformant plan has to take the agent to G, whether in any, whether it's 